In his book, The Design of Everyday Things, Don Norman emphasises that good design requires good communication. As in, when approaching a new product, designers should ask whether the language of its design is clear enough. Simply, if a person picked it up, would they be able to intuitively figure out what it does? Video games, being among the most intricately designed products, face the challenge more than most. In this context, video games could be likened to alien worlds that we enter, and willingly adhere to the whims of a game designer. To understand them, we must swiftly grasp their distinct rules and customs, which differ from our own. Some games make the act of understanding them a challenge, whilst others would like to get that quickly over with to show you something cool. As technology has advanced and design language standardised, games have become somewhat less enigmatic. They often mirror real-world activities, draw inspiration from current events, and in some aspects, even look more real than our own reality. Even the quirks of the most eccentric franchises have become common language, due to the fact they've been around for decades. As such, designers have addressed the communication problem of games by making these alien worlds… well, less alien. The most intriguing games, in my view, maintain an alien quality, often achieved by subtracting those very design standards that have become so commonplace. These games simplify their plots, eliminate on-screen widgets, and feature limited button inputs. Yet, this very limitation cultivates a desire for understanding. Consider, for instance, Japan Studios' 2001 game, Ico, a dreamy, mysterious experience that breaks down the traditional Knight Saves a Princess narrative to its most essential components. There's minimal exposition regarding the setting or the central characters in the story. However, the imposing architecture of the world and the diminutive size of the playable characters convey a great deal of information. While the player character can jump and engage in combat, their princess companion cannot. Their sole means of interaction is simply holding hands, ensuring that they can navigate obstacles together. Surprisingly, this singular action foregoes a more immersive connection than cutscenes and dialogue ever could. Ico's design principles would go on to inspire numerous other games in the ensuing years, which too took a show-don't-tell approach to storytelling and embracing a sense of uncertainty. These alien games are reminiscent of the 2016 film Arrival, where two protagonists strive to communicate with extraterrestrials. Just as a common language is discovered between two completely alien entities in the movie, great games emerge when players find common ground with the alien worlds they explore. I've been contemplating this theme through three recent games where players assume the role of a stranger in an alien environment. Each title eschews on-screen elements, traditional controls, and often admit instructions to preserve the alien nature of their worlds. And yet, they effectively communicate their intent to players, making the act of discovery more robust, and making their experiences all the more memorable. So, how do they achieve this clarity without relying on conventional instructions? I believe their success lies in adeptly addressing three distinct challenges learning unfamiliar languages, navigating unfamiliar landscapes, and grasping unfamiliar realities. Collectively, these games provide a compelling solution, not only for video games, but perhaps even our own non-digital world. How do we make alien worlds feel more human? The Rosetta Stone, a monumental granite slab dating back to 196 BC, stands as an important relic in human history. It bears a message engraved in three distinct languages, Ancient Egyptian in hieroglyphics and demotic scripts, alongside Ancient Greek. As such, the Rosetta Stone played a pivotal role in deciphering Egyptian texts, due to the minimal discrepancies between the languages. This ancient artifact served as a key to unlocking the mysteries of our past, transforming what was once considered an alien world into a comprehensible narrative. 
The game Chance of Sanar echoes the significance of the Rosetta Stone by introducing its own linguistic enigmas. Inspired by the myth of Babel, the game positions you as a traveller, endeavoured to unite culturally fractured societies within a mysterious tower. Despite being an outsider that begins with limited knowledge, your mastery of language becomes the bridge to seamless navigation and understanding among diverse groups. Throughout the game, strategically placed Rosetta Stones at transition points offer clues to the player traveller, further emphasising the linguistic complexity within the tower structure. They literally become the doors that open up to new, unknown worlds. But by the game's end, your playable character and their notepad you've been feverishly writing in becomes that Rosetta Stone that unites the divided tribes. This unique and ambitious game stems from a small French team that in 2019 became captivated by the idea of using a game to illustrate how differing languages can both divide and connect people. Their first game, an arena brawler, while entertaining, didn't quite resonate with a broader audience as they had hoped. So for their next project, the team committed to reaching a wider audience for a more universal message. They began work on Chance of Sonar in March 2020, coinciding with the onset of Covid lockdowns. It's noteworthy that during a period where communication faced heightened challenges, the team found inspiration to create a video game centred around the theme of reconnecting the world through communication. Departing from a traditional hero narrative, they opted for a cast of more varied protagonists, including scientists, interpreters and explorers. Ultimately, the focus settled on an outsider to this alien world, compelled to understand it better in order to facilitate its reunification. As this outsider, players piece together the linguistic puzzle through observation and deduction. For example, a simple game of hide and seek with a child in one of the game's early sections becomes a linguistic exercise, inferring meanings like me, you, follow, and find. Conversing with Sanar's NPCs populates an in-game book with glyphs, and at any point you can open it up and begin making your own deductions for what each means. Sometimes you'll find that you weren't too far off, whilst others need a little more context to properly understand. It's only at a few key junctures that the game asks you to assign the right glyph to an in-game image, deciphering an object or action, before telling you whether you got it right or wrong. In a nice touch, previous and future conversations update to reflect your earned knowledge. Chance of Sanar's puzzles consistently employ this logical approach, where actions and objects convey meanings, gradually unravelling the linguistic tapestry. The world of Sanar draws inspiration from Persian and Babylonian aesthetics. The lower rungs of the tower exude simplicity and dryness, while soldiers inhabit a cold fortress and bards dwell in walled gardens adorned with flowing golden streams. Mm. The distinction amongst these groups are not only evident in their physical surroundings, but also manifest in the appearance of their languages. The text of the warriors is characterised by its bluntness and focus on action, while the bard's language is steeped in artistic expression. Even the visual representation of text undergoes a transformation, transitioning from the warriors' wax carvings to the flowing cursive of the artist. In general, the game is rendered in a slick, two-tone style that makes it immediately arresting and the absence of visual clutter allows players to concentrate entirely on the task at hand. Navigating a world with little language knowledge could have been a difficult prospect, but the developers behind Sonar take a design by subtraction approach to make sure there's little conflict that could confuse this task. The game employs a straightforward control scheme. You move, interact, make notes, that's it. It's so simple that it's most enjoyable on a gamepad. Though having a keyboard plugged in to quickly type notes is handy. Simplified stealth sections, that include sneaking, disguises and social engineering, punctuate the reading, providing short bursts of variety. This approach has an intriguing dimension to the game, requiring players to read a room for cues, much like they do for the context of words. Sonar in that respect serves as a nostalgic homage to the educational adventure games of the CD-ROM era. It's a unique blend of entertainment and learning, much like those titles that prioritise knowledge acquisition while ensuring a fun time. In this vein, Chanter Sonar stands as a potential innovative tool for language education. 
It has the capacity to go further than conventional language learning approaches by not only imparting knowledge of existing languages, but also resurrecting ancient languages once thought to be lost to the sands of time. Playing Sonar, I'm reminded of a quote by L.P. Hartley. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Our histories, be they personal or national, often exist as distant, intelligible and unreliable fragments, at times lost or actively misrepresented. However, discoveries like the Rosetta Stone provide tangible glimpses into our past, offering a clearer image of who we once were. Chance Sonar achieves a similar reunification of its world not through violent conflict, but by reaching a baseline understanding. In this regard, it stands as a game from which we can all glean valuable lessons about connection. In turn, like the game's outsider, we can all become a Rosetta Stone of our own. In conceptualising their latest adventure, creative director Matteo Bodolin revealed that Don't Nod drew inspiration from Hideo Kojima's Death Stranding. Bodolin expressed admiration for its walking mechanics, where players meticulously analyse the terrain to choose optimal paths based on the weight they carry. The want was for this kind of reflex incentive to be present in their own game. In that respect, Jusan could be considered the vertical Death Stranding. While climbing is not a new concept in games, Jusan's take feels a little more novel than most. Players must definitely alternate between the characters' left and right hands to pull themselves up, but as the body adjusts naturally to grip the environment, this act quickly develops into an intuitive rhythm that lets players focus on navigating rather than grappling with the mechanics. This approach came from a direct result of the team's dedicated research into climbing, and ultimately this touch of realism gives Jusant an undeniable cool factor. Upward navigation requires careful stamina management, as excessive actions can permanently deplete the stamina bar. Players may find themselves needing to take a pause, allowing the character to shake off lactic acid buildup in their arms for a stamina gauge reset. However, certain actions, like making daring leaps to precarious outcroppings, may result in permanent setbacks. Fortunately, Jusant offers ways to mitigate progress loss. Players can establish their own checkpoints during climbs using sturdy hooks securely fastened to their ropes. These checkpoints serve as a brief reset for challenging manoeuvres, and so frustration can be completely omitted. It's important to know that there's a limited number of these hooks available at a time, and both checkpoints and stamina only reset when the player returns to solid ground, whether it's the starting point or the precise location needed for the next ascent. While I don't personally have a fear of heights, I am terrified of falling off of tall things. Climbing in games is one of those activities that I need a guaranteed safety net in order to properly engage with. Breath of the Wild, for example, gives Link a portable windbreaker to slow down potentially deadly descents. In the case of Jusant, the perpetual presence of the rope effectively circumvents the peril of plummeting from towering structures. Don't Nod meticulously design the rope to seamlessly interact with the game world, similar to how the player character's body naturally follows the terrain. In my early experiences, I found myself looping the rope around objects to discern the path forward. Not only did it naturally shorten, allowing my character to hang securely from a stable structure, but it also dispelled any lingering apprehension about falling from the mountainous terrain. Understanding the rope as a tangible and reliable object eliminated my fear of falling, providing the motivation needed to continue. That said, the game also did a lot to inspire my Herculean ascent. In Jusan, players ascend a skyscraper-sized stone mound situated in the midst of a dried ocean. The towering structure looms predominantly from the start, its peak disappearing into the clouds far above. Although the ultimate goal is not immediately visible, the mental impetus is clear. Reach the summit by any means necessary. Initially, the purpose may seem rooted in the gaming instinct to conquer lofty heights, but exploration unveils a deeper motivation. At the pinnacle of this mound, there might be a solution to the world's most pressing issues. The game's structure revolves around a rhythmic cycle of climbing, resting, and exploring. Each ascent provides incremental doses of world building, conveyed through ambient sounds encapsulated in seashells, written diaries, and carefully placed set dressing. Jusant then unfolds somewhat like a symbolic fable. Players witness the reverse collapse of a civilization where simplicity resides at the bottom and decadence at the top. 
Forced to descend as the shoreline receded, the inhabitants embraced a more Spartan culture, with their focus solely on acquiring water. The game serves as a collection of snapshots from their distant past, with remnants of boats and broken platforms scattered throughout the environment, serving as poignant reminders of the communities and daily routines of a bygone golden age. In the typical post-apocalyptic landscape, the motivation to save the world often dwindles due to the absence of clear environmental solutions. However, like Death Stranding, Jasan manages to make the goal seem within reach, albeit requiring a colossal effort. Despite the apparent scarcity of water, an alien companion emerges soon into the game's runtime, capable of revitalising dormant plants to unlock new pathways. There's a possibility that these pathways may hold the key to resolving the central conflict in Jacent. This extraterrestrial ally also serves as a directional guide, consistently leading the player upward. Unlike many adventure games with straightforward navigation, Jassant embraces the challenge of navigation itself. As the game progresses, inventive features are introduced such as bugs functioning like mobile grappling points and the intensifying effect on the sun on dwindling stamina. Similar to Valve's Portal, these elements are introduced, refined and seamlessly integrated into the overall experience without overstaying their welcome. This goes for how human-made structures initially facilitate climbing until the game gradually transitions to a more unpredictable, natural environment. This shift aligns with the overarching theme of nature versus man, suggesting a narrative where humanity might have conceded defeat. The art direction, as may be expected from a French developer, pays homage to the work of graphic artist Mobius, influencing everything from anarchistic technologies to the bleached and sandy environments. The colour palette, like his work, leans heavily on orange and blue, cleverly used in alternating contrast to guide players organically along the right path, reminiscent of how lights are employed in games to illuminate the way forward. With this rendering, the development team aimed to replicate the soft and impressionistic look of their concept art. Notably, the game employs Unreal Engine 5 ray tracing, although my PC struggled to fully render it. Consequently, the shadows take on a pointillism appearance, seamlessly blending with the flatter rendering of in-game models. While the nostalgic nods to 8-bit graphics and low-poly 3D of years past, it made me wonder if in the future we'd also get throwbacks to the aesthetic of flawed ray tracing. If Jassant were to be described by an aesthetic, it would be something akin to Coral Punk, reminiscent of settings found in Waterworld or Final Fantasy X. The society within the game was intricately woven around a deep connection with the ocean, evident in the frequent appearance of Cairns, those pebble spires commonly seen on nature trails and beaches. Reflecting the ancient practice of creating landmarks and burial mounds, Cairns and Jassan not only mark the graves of those who departed, but they also grow taller as the ascent progresses. In retrospect, Jacent resonates with the likes of Journey or Amzu, a magnum opus created by developers focused entirely on bringing forth this singular work. And yet, it came from the studio better known for Life is Strange and, maybe less so, Vampyr and Remember Me. Despite their background in narrative-driven games, Jacent deviates from that norm, underscoring their ability to delve into varied genres and, surprisingly, excel. With Jacent, the developers set out on a mission to craft a narrative exploring the intricacies of ecology. Challenging conventional perspectives, they chose a vertical world over the traditional horizontal setting. This deliberate restriction sparked a reflection on the design of life within such constraints, leading to a profound story about a community's symbolic relationship with both the towering structure they lived in and the dwindling water sources. It becomes a tale that resonates with our own ecological challenges, prompting contemplation about the way we navigate unfamiliar worlds. It is made literal through the act of climbing a colossal alien structure. In essence, Jasan unfolds as a story about navigating alien landscapes. Learning how to traverse these environments serves as a gateway to understanding the origins of the world's unique conditions, and ultimately, why it is a world worth saving. The Xbox Live Arcade era is one of my favourite trends in the history of video games. Sure, digital storefronts had existed on PC beforehand, as did smaller games that now had a route to market once more eliminated by brick and mortar retail. But the XBLA era in particular had an ethos that these previous trends didn't. 
Because these weren't the expected big budget releases the Xbox 360 was known for, XBLA titles had the freedom to omit elements associated with those games and occasionally reintroduce older concepts. Bastion, the first game from Hades developer Supergiant, feels like a glossy remake of a Super Nintendo game that never existed, because it preserves the simplicity of controls and presentation reminiscent of those classic titles while embracing the technological ambition of its era. Shadow Complex served as a sophisticated tech demo targeted specifically at indie developers, illustrating the capability to create smaller games using the Unreal Engine, but it also stood as an elegant homage to the classic Super Metroid, marking an impressive revival of the Metroidvania genre. XBLA games in general could be summed up as so. For a low entry fee, you'd get a short but satisfying game experience, typically centred around a singular, meticulously polished mechanic or concept the developers enthusiastically delved into exploring the full potential of that across a truncated playtime. Apart from those arcade titles crafted for repeated play, these games had the freedom to make an entrance, captivate, and gracefully exit before wearing out their welcome. This observation also applies to the games discussed so far, and interestingly, two of the featured games in this video were played via the modern successors to XBLA, Xbox Games Pass. Granted, that comes with a small warning that they may not be available to play on Game Pass long after this video has been published. So, you know, yeah. Limbo stood out as a prominent figure from the Xbox Live Arcade era, yet it's a game I personally didn't resonate with. While it boasted a cool look, it didn't offer much beyond that for me. However, my lack of appreciation may have stemmed from not fully grasping the developer's intentions, nor perhaps them fully realising that intent in their first effort. Subsequently, their next game refined concepts introduced in Limbo and more effectively realised their vision. This evolution resulted in 2016's Inside, which I hold as an all-time favourite game. It returned to the enigmatic adventure games reminiscent of Delphine's Another World, Inside unfolds as a playable nightmare, where the path forward can only be inferred through engagement with this terrifying world. Inside's greatest success lies in the seamless progression achieved solely through animation and level design, guiding players wordlessly. While not an easy experience, the harshness of certain death animations serves to emphasise the cruelty of this in-game world. Remarkably, the game conveys its narrative about conventional explanations, creating an experience that seemingly could only exist in a post-ICO era. In this regard, Inside stands as a true successor, utilising design by subtraction to craft a genuinely unique gaming experience. As said, it seemed as if Inside was the game that developer Playdead was destined to create, with each technological breakthrough and design endeavour culminating in this singular experience. The question then was, how could they follow up on such a remarkable achievement? As it turns out, the lead visionaries behind the game would have to part ways with Play Dead to embark on new explorations, and find worlds beyond the nightmares of Inside. Cocoon is one of, and so far the most successful, of these post-Play Dead alien incursions. And what an alien experience it is. Cast as a beetle-like creature, you'll explore distant globes with unique environments and conditions, and eventually use those very same globes to solve puzzles. The developer describes the mechanic as suitcasing, allowing players to pocket globes inside of others to solve navigational puzzles, for example transitioning from one globe world to another to bypass an obstacle. As you progress, the game grants you new abilities tied to the globes you carry on your back. For instance, a red and dusty desert globe activates invisible pathways in another realm. These globes then not only serve as their own self-contained playgrounds, but also function as keys to unlock additional globes. It's a game that I imagine Super Mario 64 designer Shigeru Miyamoto would absolutely adore in that respect. This suitcasing mechanic evolves as you delve deeper into the game, allowing you to nest even more worlds inside of each other and move elements across them to activate new mechanics. But what's remarkable is that Cocoon presents challenges that I can easily comprehend as they happen, yet struggle to really articulate afterwards. I imagine even watching this video of Cocoon doesn't quite explain what's happening. I suppose then that's a testament to the game's ability to communicate its world and rules of reality effectively to the player. One means that Cocoon enhances that experience is by subtly eliminating the need for backtracking, 
Once you enter a puzzle, you remain confined until you unravel its mysteries. This deliberate restriction serves to stimulate creative thinking. Cocoon executes the strategy so massively, I often overlooks it even being employed. Like all the games mentioned so far, Cocoon employs a design that subtracts unnecessary elements to ensure clarity in communicating its most intricate aspects. The game simplifies controls to just a stick and a single button, and it goes a step further by allowing players to completely remount those controls for maximum accessibility. This simplicity in gameplay, however, doesn't diminish the complexity of the puzzles, which serve as excellent mental exercises. The game adopts a Mario-style progression, gradually introducing and expanding upon puzzle mechanics. As a player, you learn to harness the power of the spheres, and the game subtly guides you to explore new applications, inverts and subvert powers, unveiling a range of possibilities. Remarkably, Cocoon allows all this while maintaining a wordless experience throughout preserving its carefully crafted alien atmosphere without overtly providing solutions. It entrusts players, believing in their capabilities and encouraging them to surpass their own expectations. Similar to Jassant and Sanar, the mechanics in Cocoon contribute to the overall ambience of its world. Initially, the developers focused solely on the logical and mathematical aspects of the idea, neglecting considerations of the universe it would inhabit, its art style, or its narrative. Armed with only these mechanics, they embarked on creating a prototype for the game. Over several months, they translated their ideas into code, unveiling a vibrant realm of colourful labyrinths, symbols and squares. This process served as a litmus test, revealing whether the conceptual mechanics translated into a coherent experience. The game's lore and backstory then were developed through extensive discussions, delving into the motivations of the characters and the peculiarities of the universe. However, the intention was not to provide explicit details from the outset. Cocoon's art, in particular, stands out as a noteworthy aspect, aligning seamlessly with its design intent and conveying more about the world than words ever could. Employing a gestural feedback system reminiscent of iPhone design principles, the world responds dynamically to player actions, fostering a sense of interconnectedness. Despite its alien appearance, Cocoon distinguishes itself as one of the most human-centric design games in recent memory. Rather than relying on traditional instructional design to teach players controls, it opts for an intuitive approach, allowing players to naturally grasp the path forward. So while I struggle to convey the puzzles of Cocoon in this video, I understand them completely during play thanks to this design. To me, Cocoon exudes the essence of a primal game. A creation that could seamlessly fit into any era while also embodying the results of years of refinement and experience. With one of the most straightforward control schemes in video games and a universally understandable design, Cocoon could be the perfect entry game for someone unfamiliar with the medium, aiming to showcase its inherent greatness. In a weird way, it gives me the same warm nostalgia I feel for Super Mario 64, portraying an alien world that extends into multiple uncharted territories, and how these realms intertwine and interact in a manner beyond the grasp of my own reality. If Play Dead's Inside offered a playable nightmare, Cocoon then serves as a journey into dreamscapes, exploring the interplay between the subconscious and our own tangible existence. Throughout these three games, a set of cohesive design principles emerges that address approachable alien worlds. For one thing, the intent from all three wasn't to present completely hostile environments, as that would undermine the essence of their gaming experience. They all adopt simple control schemes, with Jassant being the exception, incorporating a slightly more involved interface to enhance the challenge. Moreover, they embrace themes that are universal and easily relatable. With the exception of Cocoon's boss fights, the game steer clear of violence, prompting the use of intellect over brute strength to overcome challenges. Accessibility is also a key focus across these games, with remappable buttons and predominantly wordless instructions. This shared approachability ethos even extended to each game's development process, with the Jassan developers stating that they spent most of their development time fine-tuning the difficulty curve. They even introduced mechanics based on smoothing out potential bumps, such as stamina replenishment during climbs. However, despite all these games' intentions to be approachable, they don't sacrifice the challenge. They are also, on their most basic level, fun to play. Perhaps the most important driver 
in wanting to understand them. The reason I felt compelled to explore these three games and their shared ethos is the fact that they're also very recent releases. In a year that has been dominated by remakes and sequels to Eternal franchises, finding truly unique experiences in games is something to be coveted. And sure, while these titles all take familiar touchstones from other games, their identities are unique. Their embrace of an alien nature aligns with what video games excel at, transporting us to uncharted worlds with new rules and allowing us to unravel them like intricate puzzle boxes. In a year marked by familiarity, these three successfully introduced players to unfamiliar delights. And amid an era characterised by tense alliances, they also serve as demonstrations for how we can and should reconnect with each other. These three games, like Ico was on its release, are incredibly refreshing, and I suppose that, in attempting to pinpoint what makes them exceptional, my hope is that it can serve as a guide for more experiences like them. To that end, I invite you to share your thoughts in the comments section below. While I've come across commendable games like Sable and Norco during my research into Alien Worlds, I'm genuinely interested in discovering more titles akin to Jassant, Sanar, and Cocoon that embody exemplary human-centric design. Additionally, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on which games you believe could thrive with a design-by-subtraction approach. Until next time, I've been James, and I'll see you all in the next video.